So next up, I'm really happy to introduce David Shield. You know, Dave is a colleague at APU, as a faculty member, and uh, I've really enjoyed his uh, new book, Many Things Under a Rock, which, believe it or not, is about octopuses. David? <clears throat> Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here, and I really appreciate a, a chance to talk to you guys. Um, let me see if I can make the clicker work here. All right, good. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about um, giant Alaskan octopuses, um, and this is based on a, about 30 work, 30 years of work I've been I've been doing here um, in Alaska and around around the Pacific, really. Uh, and, you know, over that period of time, I've had a lot of uh, different uh, supporters and uh, collaborators, and I just want to briefly acknowledge uh, that, you know, this is not just my work. This is the work of, of, of many. Now I can't get it to go to the next slide. There we go. Um, so this is... Uh, this is a, um, a, a juvenile giant Pacific octopus. And, and uh, I imagine everybody knows, uh, if you see one, what an octopus looks like. Um, so what I want to talk about today a little bit is, is how to tell what kind of octopus you have in front of you. And so um, in this picture, uh, you can sort of see two very distinctive traits uh, of this kind of octopus. This is the species Enteroctopus doflini. And uh, they have these. Uh, uh, longitudinal mantle folds, these sort of uh, folds of skin that run alongside the mantle, and this sort of patch and groove, which looks a little bit like a, a network or a lattice that's been laid over the skin or, or is, is laid within the skin. And those are very distinctive of, um, uh, of, of this kind of octopus here in Prince William Sound. And, and when I came here, uh, we thought we had this species and, and a different species that I, I've never seen up here, uh, was rumored to be up here, but... Um, uh, I won't be talking about that one, the, the uh, red octopus. I'll be skipping that one today. Um, and so if we want to look at how do we recognize a giant Pacific octopus, we have this sort of inventory. Um, octopuses are famous for how they can change their body pattern and how they can look very different. So um, there are two octopuses in those pictures there, one on the top and one on the bottom. And the one on the bottom is more in a camouflage mode. But these are the same species. And you can see... Um, uh, you can see the numbers one on there are the uh, longitudinal uh, folds on the mantle, the mantle being the sort of sac on the back behind the eyes there. Um, and you can see um, uh, it's very smooth under the eye where the number th uh, three is located. Um, and then there are uh, sometimes these big, yeah, these big papillae over the eye. Um, and and uh, where the number four is located, there's a, a frontal white spot, sort of below the eyes and right in front of the, uh, on the front of the head of the animal, right above the arms. Um, and so all of these things are, are part of the characteristics that, um, after working with these guys for a while, uh, you know, have, are, are very distinctive to this species. Uh, and then we started finding these octopuses in Prince William Sound. Um, and uh, these guys are not smooth under the eye. Where the number three is located, you could see three little tiny papillae that look a little bit like eyelashes. Um, and also, if you look where the number one is and the number six is, there's, there's no longitudinal mantle folds. There are these bumps, which we call papillae, but there are no folds. And then if you notice where the number two is, there's this sort of skirt or frill around the mantle at about where the equator is. And below that, there's no texture. Um, and so it turns out that, that um, that's very different than our giant Pacific octopus. So we have these man uh, longitudinal mantle folds on the um, left. And then on the right, we just have this frill around the skirt of the octopus or the skirt around the equator of the octopus. And this is not characteristic of any previously known species of octopus. This was completely novel. Um, and uh, if we look at this uh, novel octopus, on the left, you can see that um, single frontal white spot, um, particularly in the lower picture. Sometimes um, in the upper picture on the left, you'll get this sort of W-shaped compound um, frontal white spot. In this novel animal, you, we, we have two distinct frontal white spots uh, below the eyes. 
And you can also see the um, papillae over the eye are very narrow and spindly and flat looking, uh, as opposed to the ones on the giant Pacific octopus, which are sort of uh, more like the shape of a shark fin. Um, and so now we can look at those two, two octopuses now. And now we have the same picture again on the bottom and the, um, the novel octopus type on the top. And I filled in the chart for the novel octopus type, and you can see a lot of differences. Uh, the longitudinal mantle skin folds are present for the familiar giant Pacific octopus, absent for the novel. The lateral mantle frill is absent for the familiar octopus, uh, present for the novel. Um, they both have large papillae over the eye, but they're somewhat different. Uh, there are no papillae under the eye for the giant Pacific octopus. There are three little papillae under the eye for the novel octopus. Um, there's one frontal white spot versus two. Uh, and um, then some of the other traits are, are not quite as distinctive. Now, I'm not going to show you the data, but these animals are genetically distinct as well. Uh, they both seem to be in the same genus. They're close relatives, but um, uh, they, they do sort out very distinctly genetically. And so this is a, a species that hadn't been noticed before. Uh, there we go. Um, so where are they? These are some uh, data from the Prince William Sound uh, spot test fishery for spot prawns uh, done by Alaska uh, Department of Fish and Game. And uh, the, um, the points that are labeled are the places and years where we've found the novel octopus just in that survey alone. And so you can see they're pretty much everywhere that these guys are dropping shrimp pots. Uh, they tend to be a little deeper uh, on average than the giant Pacific octopus. We found the giant Pacific octopus all the way up into the inner tidal, where it's one of those, um, when the tide is out, the dinner is served kind of uh, resources. It's a large octopus that occurs right up in the inner tidal. Um, but we've never found the novel one up in the inner tidal. We're catching them in shrimp pots. Uh, and as you can see in the little chart there, it shows from uh, 2012 and 13 up to 2017, what percent of the catch on this survey was the novel octopus type. And you can see that it's sometimes as much as 75 or 80 percent of the octopus catch on this survey is this unusual, previously unnoticed octopus type. So it's... Um, it's not always what you're going to catch, but if you're catching octopuses in a shrimp pot, you might be seeing these guys alongside of uh, the giant Pacific octopus. Um, so now you get to practice your newfound skills in telling them apart. Um, some of these octopuses, this is uh, half of the ones caught in 2017, um, some of them are the novel type. And some of them are the giant Pacific octopus. And since I've showed you these pictures of underwater octopuses, uh, many of you, I imagine, when you see an octopus, if you've hauled it up in a shrimp pot, you're not going to see it underwater. You're going to see it um, on the deck. And so these are all deck photographs. Um, and so what you look at here uh, to tell them apart is you look for the white spots and you look for the, um, uh, the reticulation, that uh, reticulated network of um, lines in the skin. And I uh, don't know if I can make the laser pointer work. Yeah, it vanishes on the screen, unfortunately. Um, so uh, I'll just uh, tell you then which ones are which, now that you've had a few minutes to look and see if you can figure it out. There we go. So um, on the left side of the screen, we have the giant Pacific. And all of these have the um, reticulated black lines through the mantle a little bit, somewhere in the image. And occasionally, you can make out the white spots. On the novel side, pardon me, I'm just going to go point at the screen here. On the novel side, you can sometimes see the white spots, like right in that image above my finger, over the arms. You can see the two. The two white spots. Uh, and then if you look in each of the other images, you can sort of make that out. And on these ones, you're going to see um, just one frontal white spot. One of the challenges was looking at the frontal white spots as you um, 
as they lie on the deck there is out of the water, that skin will slide around a lot. So ex they move quite, quite a bit from their normal central position. Um, so these appear to be different species. Uh, and I, I think it's fascinating to, um, to take a look at that. Uh, the, these are the collection locations where we've detected at least one of this uh, new animal, which I'm, for a common name, I'm calling it the frilled giant Pacific octopus. It's giant because most octopuses never get above a pound or so. And these guys get up at least, uh, I think we've had two and a half kilograms, um, which is well into the size of the giant Pacific octopus. We don't know just how big they get because we've seen so few of them over the years um, in total. Uh, so uh, these are the collection locations that I'm aware of um, from my base in, at uh, Alaska Pacific University in Anchorage. And so you've got um, uh, these red dots are ones that have been genetically tested. Um, the yellow eye all the way down uh, in, in Washington. Um, those are photos uh, recorded on inaturalist.org that, that I went through. Uh, there was one collected at the Sitka Sound Science Center and one that ended up at the Alaska Sea Life Center, I think, from Astoria Canyon. Um, uh, so yeah, these are a large species of octopus, uh, relatively unknown other than the information I've just given you um, that you may find here in Prince William Sound. OK, now uh, that gives you a little bit of, uh, those are the only two species of octopus that uh, you're likely to collect off the bottom in Prince William Sound. Um, uh, but I want to talk now a little bit about octopus abundance. Um, so m many years ago, I was going through uh, temperature data and octopus counts at the same time. And uh, when I plotted them on the same graph, I noticed that there was this sort of almost an inverse relationship, but it wasn't particularly tight. And um, so that got me interested in looking at how octopus density follows temperature. Where is the uh, receiver that's receiving this guy? There we go. OK, great. So um, uh, what I started to do is look at sort of the critical period for octopus recruitment, which is prior to the temperature th at the point where you collect them. So the octopus recruits onto the, to the bottom of the ocean um, and starts growing up down there. But they start out in the plankton. And so I was curious about uh, what was happening to them in relationship to temperature uh, a little bit before they were big enough for me to find in my surveys. And in that case, they would be in the plankton. And so I started looking. The hard period for animals that live in the plankton is often the winter. And so I started looking at what was going on in the winter uh, at the, at, you know, a year or two before the octopuses would be showing up in my counts. And uh, this is the plot of those data um, based on the 30-month winter average sea surface temperature uh, down current of Prince William Sound out in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, I'm sorry, up current of the Prince William Sound before the current reaches us. Um, and what you can see is a very strong relationship with, with temperature. The warmer it gets, the fewer octopuses we see um, a year and a half, two years later on the beach. Um, and this was true in subsamples as well. Uh, so here's a uh, 1995 to 2004 subsample. The temperature generally was cool in that period, but variable enough that we could see a statistical relationship between the number of octopuses. And you can see that's the same downward sloping line. Now, if we look at that period in 2005 to 2010, there was a much greater range of temperatures, and the temperature was actually falling during that period. Um, and we again see the same relationship. And in the third set of data, um, that, that relationship falls apart. Um, this is not statistically significant, because in 2011 to 2016, the temperature was pretty uniformly cold. Um, and, and then in, 2000, uh, uh, in the early years, it was uniformly cold until 2014. But then in 2015 and 2016, it was, we had record highs. And you can see the um, octopuses collected following those years. Uh, the abundance just plummeted. 
Um, and this is not just happening in Prince William Sound. Those data were from Prince William Sound. Um, but the data on the right now are from Washington State waters, uh, mostly from Puget Sound, but not entirely. And this includes three additional years of data beyond the data from Prince William Sound. And you can see the same thing is happening. The relationship's even stronger there. Um, as things warm up, the octopus abundance declines which is not good news uh, for here in Alaska in um, this period of global climate change. Um, and mostly this is happening, this is the, um, the size distribution of octopuses collected, and the uh, dark bars are sort of um, uh, warmer years and warming years, and the uh, pale bars are um, periods of decreasing and cooler temperatures particularly from 2005 to 2014. And what you can see there is uh, just this spike in the youngest ones, which reinforces my suspicion that what's going on is, is important um, during the years when um, uh, these guys are, are very young, from egg hatching into the plankton. It's survival in that period that's important. Um, so what we're seeing then is uh, that uh, these winter sea surface temperatures, which is where the temperature data is coming from, um, typically are correlated within the typical lifespan of an octopus, up current from where we survey them. Um, we see higher recruitment at cooler temperatures. Uh, the higher temperatures appear to disrupt development. Um, ba this is based on other studies. And also the cooler temperatures promote uh, nut nutrient upwelling. Cooler temperatures at the surface promote nutrient upwelling, which then allows a, a more robust food chain, more productive food chain for the octopuses, which protects them from protection. So those seem to be the things that are really determining octopus abundance from year to year uh, right now. Um, now I'd like to talk a little bit about um, transporting octopuses if you happen to bring one up on the deck. Um, we keep octopuses in uh, the lab at Alaska Pacific University um, for a behavioral study, undergraduate students and graduate students, some of whom I believe are in the room. Yep, there they are. Um, and uh, sometimes people uh, who take boats out of Whittier collect an octopus. They bring it up in a shrimp pot and are curious about could we use it in the lab? Yes, we could. Thank you very much. We appreciate your interest. Um, but it has to be healthy. And it turns out to be difficult to get an octopus from a shrimp, out, shrimp pot on deck in Prince William Sound all the way back to Whittier in really healthy condition. And if it's not really healthy, it, it doesn't work very well for a behavioral study. Um, so we can get down to Whittier and meet you, but it, it's got to be healthy by the time it gets to us. And so what that requires. Um, is uh, uh, getting them in. And so you need, often it helps to have a mesh collection bag, a thermometer, a refractometer, possibly a pump with a 10 foot long intake hose, uh, and a cooler. And if you need to, and you know you're going to go out and pull a bunch of shrimp pots, um, we can loan you that kit. Um, So what needs to happen is um, you have to handle the animal gently. Octopuses are very strong. They have a lot of suction cups. They'll adhere to your deck just like a, uh, a bath mat. Um, but they're also very easily injured. And so they have to be handled gently. They have to be put uh, directly into a mesh bag and protected from the heat of your deck if it's a hot day or the ice of your deck if it's a cold day. Uh, the mesh bag helps us pull them up from the cooler gently without injuring them. And then they need cold seawater, salty seawater, and clean seawater. Um, pretty basic stuff, but surprisingly sometimes hard to find on the surface of Prince William Sound on a bright sunny day in May, June, or July. Um, you need to keep the cooler out of the sun, and oddly enough, out of the rain, because many coolers will have a little inset lid, and if it's pouring rain on that cooler, it will drip inside the cooler, um, even though the lid is closed, and can freshen the water in there. Um, you need to get seawater uh, that's salty and cold. And um, 
During some times of the year, salty cold seawater sits right on the top of Prince William Sound. But during much of the uh, spring and summer season, there is a warmer freshwater lens that sits on the surface. And you're pulling that octopus up from coldy, cold salty water um, at depth. And so what you need to do in order to get past that surface freshwater lens is uh, drop the intake of your pump below the freshwater lens. One way, there are many ways to do that, but one way to do it is just put a weighted intake hose down a, that's about 10 feet um, and, and pull it down uh, so that you're drawing water in from 10 feet below your boat. And if you do that, uh, generally you're going to get water that's um, salty and cold. Uh, and the limit seems to be about uh, 30 parts per thousand and 14 degrees C. You have to be colder than that um, for the octopuses to do well. Um, and this is what that loaner kit looks like. Um, we have two of these in, in the lab at, print, at, in, at Alaska Pacific. And when people are excited to bring an octopus back, um, if they catch one, you've got to know beforehand. We can loan it out. But otherwise, um, you know, many boats have this stuff already on board, except maybe the mesh bag. But um, uh, so anyway, if you're interested, uh, please be in touch. Um, I'm easy to find. Uh, I'm on the web. David Scheel, Alaska Octopus, uh, print, uh, Alaska Pacific University. Um, and if you want to know a lot more about octopuses, I did, I did write a book, as Paul was kind enough to mention. And uh, this is it. It's been out for almost a year now. There will be a paperback version out in June. And if I can ever get the editing done, there will be a young reader's edition for fourth through eighth grade readers in general. Um, out in January of uh, next year. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions or talk octopuses if anybody's interested. All right, question for David. In the back. Lee? I'm curious if someone wasn't to bring an octopus back with the Why don't you yeah, so the, so the question is, if you just want to release your octopus, which is another great thing to do with an octopus you've caught, what's the best way to release it back into the water? Um, during the time on, that it's on your deck, all of the uh, advice I just gave about keeping it strong and healthy apply. Cold, salty, um, gentle. Um, but once you've done that, you can just let it slide back into the water. Uh, unless there's a seal or sea lion uh, paying a great deal of attention, in which case you're just feeding the seal or sea lion. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so, so the question has to do with the uh, correlation of um, octopus populations with the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Um, thank you for referring to my uh, 20 to 30 years of octopus research and, and noting what a short period of time that is. Um, the National Science Foundation regards anything that goes longer than five years as a long-term ecological research project. That's crazy. And they fund people in three to five year increments, which is insane. People need an entire career in order to learn this stuff. You have seen uh, Alutic Pride having been working here in their capacity for 40 years. Uh, David Irons was here yesterday and talked about doing himself 40 years of bird surveys. I've only managed 20 to 30 years, depending on which data set you're looking at. I apologize. Uh, I wish I could have done more. Um, in, in answer to your question about uh, Pacific data, Decadal Oscillation, that was the original uh, signal that I looked at with my sea surface temperature data. And the expectation is that the Pacific Decadal Oscillation is actually calculated from sea surface temperature data. Uh, and the expectation is that those same correlations exist. 
when I went to talk to the Pacific Decadal Oscillation scientists at the University of Seattle who uh, sort of uh, documented that pattern and have been looking at it, they said, don't try and correlate this with Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is a summary statistic across uh, the entire North Pacific. In, uh, instead, just use sea surface temperature. It'll be better. And so that's what I went with. So I never did fully analyze how the relationship exists with the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, but I'm sure it's there. Another question? Uh, Mitch McCloskey here looked at uh, some aspects of sleep physiology in, in uh, octopuses. And um, uh, Marley Loomis here, also in the room, uh, looked at aspects of how they, their sensory behavior works, how their behavior is inter, interlaced with how they see distances. Um, so we have different studies. Often the student finds uh, particular directions to take. Um, and sometimes we're looking at aspects of wellness. Uh, sometimes we're looking at aspects of cognition. Um, but uh, the reason I emphasize them as behavioral studies is because I uh, try to keep the animals alive, healthy, and behaving normally in the lab. Um, and I don't want anyone to confuse that with uh, other kinds of work which requires sacrificing the animals. What, uh, David, uh, shrimping. We talked about shrimping. Uh, is that a major part of an octopus's diet? Or we know they're in the shrimp trap, so yeah. Right, so the question has to do with octopuses getting in the shrimp traps. Why are they in there? Um, Octopuses do inch, eat shrimp. It's, it's not necessarily a major part of the diet that we've been able to document either um, chemically or often you can collect the remains of their prey in front of the den. Uh, so we don't see it that way. We don't see it when we look at chemical signatures as a major part of their diet. Uh, one of the reasons why is that um, I, I, have, I have once seen octopuses pursuing shrimp underwater and the octopus makes a pounce and the shrimp makes an escape move and the octopus has to repeat that several times and never did catch, catch a shrimp when I was watching it. Um, the only way I've seen an octopus catch a shrimp is by uh, seining. <laughs> uh, so it puts out one arm and then a shrimp bumps into the arm and it brings its other ar arm around and now it, it brings the two arms together and unless the shrimp actually goes up it could bring the, um, the arms together and then put its web over the top and, and catch it that way. Um, so we know they do eat shrimp. They may be entering, the, of course, in the shrimp pot or crab pot. They will have much better success because the shrimp can't get away as well. Um, but they may be attracted to the shrimp pot for the same reason the shrimp are, is by scent. Um, but once in there, they may stay because it feels like shelter. And also, there's food right there. So then when you pull the pot up, often on disturbance, the octopus at first will hold on. But then as they come up into the light, um, many of them get uh, nervous and they want to go back down deep. And so then they're looking for a way to get out. And that all has to do with how fast things come up. If they come up quick enough and the octopus hasn't oozed between the mesh yet, um, great. Octopuses have no trouble entering and leaving your shrimp pots they, and your crab pots. They can do that very easily. They're coming and going. In fact, the shrimp are coming and going from your pots as well. They have no trouble leaving, but they tend to accumulate a little more quickly than the octopuses. Through the web, through, through the mesh. Uh, the shrimp usually uh, find their way uh, out through the, um, what's the little entrance called? Uh, funnel, yes, through the funnel again. Um, but it takes them a little longer, so they do accumulate. But the octopus are going through the mesh? The, the octopus can leave through the mesh or the funnel, whichever it happens to discover. Interesting. All right. Any other questions for David? Online questions? All right. All right. Great. Thanks, Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure.
super fascinating. Thanks, Dr. Shield. Uh, first of all, we're about to take a little break um, and uh, till 10.15, but first, we're very happy that the Prince William Sound Science Center in Cordova has a watch party. We did this last year, so we're ready to, uh, we'll get in them online. We're gonna, say, we're gonna say hello. We'll try to make a little interactive here. As we're setting that up, uh, we're really happy to have the Science Center as a partner uh, with the foundation, um, with this event. Um, we've also uh, are always trying to expand our outreach to other communities. Um, and so if you ever have a connection with a community that would like to host a watch party next year, let us know. Ready? There they are, okay. Yeah, they are. All, right. All right, hello. Hello, hello Cordova. Hello. It looks like a sunny day there. Excellent. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right, well, that's right. Try to keep that involved a little bit. Oh. Okay, good. We got to turn it off. Okay. okay. <laughs> look, oh, yeah. uh -uh. All right. Well, we're going to take a break. Uh, we'll be back at uh, a short break. We're back in here at ten fifteen. Um, and for a uh, presentation at Two Gats, Alaska Corporation, and the Village and Regional Corporations. So enjoy the break, and we'll see you in uh, 1015.